Have you ever played the game? Would you rather? <laughs> Let's all play it now. Let's imagine we're all around the age of 85. Let's say. Would you rather your mind decay first or your body decay first? All right, hands up. Who would prefer the mind to decay first? Any takers? A few takers. All right. How about the body decay first? Yeah, I'm with you guys. <laughs> I study two diseases: one of the mind, Alzheimer's disease, and one of the body, colorectal cancer. I work in the field of data science, underpinned by years of biology training. And I think it's fascinated that such detailed biological insight can come from what are essentially lines on a spreadsheet. But I think we need to, need to move beyond the blood and bone, measuring the blood and bone that we do in Western medicine today. I think we need to move into the realm of measuring where the body meets the mind. Rene Descartes is famous for his proposition: "I think, therefore I am," postulating that the mind and the body exist in a duality. But what if this duality isn't actually a duality at all? What if? Like many of the scientific discoveries we've made over time, there is no distinction between where the body ends and the mind begins. They exist maybe in a continuum. Whether this duality exists or not has been pondered for millennia. The likes of Plato, Parmenides, Karl Marx, Patton Paul Churchland have all grappled with the mind-body problem, and we still haven't solved it. But it's just as relevant today. As it has been for thousands of years, maybe even more so, because we now have the ability to scientifically measure the mind-body relationship. As a biologist, I relate to the school of thought encompassed by monism, the idea that the mind and body can exist in a continuum. What strikes me in studying Alzheimer's disease and cancer is that we are probably already more capable than we think at measuring our existence beyond blood and bone. We need to move into the realm of measuring the link between the mind and the body. Alzheimer's disease and the resulting dementia is a fear we all harbour. Every time I forget where my keys are or forget words in a sentence, a small curl of fear moves up my spine. I know I am not alone in my fear. A recent survey showed two-thirds of people over 50 in the UK fear getting dementia more than they fear being diagnosed with cancer. Fear of the unknown is always a fear to be reckoned with. I think of Alzheimer's disease as a disease of mental incapacitation, and yet the most definitive method for diagnosing Alzheimer's today is a physiological test, a PET scan, or a lumbar puncture. I don't know about any of you, but personally, I would prefer to have a blood test than a giant needle in my spine, or an expensive PET scan to monitor any dementia I might have in the future. My team is developing a new technology in the form of an analytical blood test that can determine your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Early results suggest that we can predict the presence of disease decades before you might have the Devastating realization: you've forgotten who the person sitting next to you at dinner is. Ultimately, we want to use this blood test to tell you you need to go and have further screening, or give you reassurance that you can happily go and enjoy your retirement. Because blood tests are cheap and easy to administer, this technology could be accessible to anyone. Which means we can, if we choose, understand more about what is going to happen to us. As we move through our lives, my biology brain can quite happily accept the idea that physiological measurements can tell us how we're going to progress through our disease. But what really excites me is that we are able to finally measure the intricate changes in our biology that herald a warning sign for our minds to how we think and how we feel.
Our results require validation, but if we can start to measure the intricate changes in our blood and measure how it affects our minds, we can start to scientifically explore a problem that has been pondered for thousands of years. I also work on colorectal cancer, the second biggest killer of all cancers in both men and women. If you are diagnosed with cancer on the left of your colon, my left, you have a better prognosis than if you are diagnosed on the right. So it's no surprise that tumors on the left are biologically different to tumors on the right, which raises the question: Should they be treated differently? My team. Along with our clinical partners, are using a sophisticated statistical analysis to answer just this question. Our early results suggest that the benefits of the currently available treatments are surprisingly not affected, despite the biological and prognostic differences we see in left and right cancers. In other words, even if you have cancer on the left or the right, the current treatments we have. Are just as effective, no matter which side. Ultimately, we want to take this a step further to not only understand the effects of treatments on different stages and different types and sides of cancer, but also provide personalised information on what's going to happen to you throughout your treatments. Details like how quickly will you recover after treatment, how dependent will you be on care, and for how long. I think the need for this kind of information is driven by our desire for reassurance. But if cancer is just about blood and bone, why do we care so much about reassuring ourselves we know what is going to happen to us? Our minds could have an impact on cancer, and I think it's time we measured this. I think we often overlook the emotional toll of cancer and its effect on outcomes. We certainly don't measure it. We certainly don't measure the emotional stage we're in as we move through diagnos diagnosis and treatment, which means we are much further behind in understanding how a disease of the body is impacted by our mind. We are inundated with books and blogs and articles all about the effects a positive mindset can have on outcomes, and yet there is very little conclusive scientific evidence either way. I see the wealth of analytical tools. We have available today. It is so frustrating. We're not making use of them. It's so frustrating. We have the ability to collect, store, and analyze this data. It's all about the data. Let's not just collect information about our bodies: X-rays, biopsies, and blood tests. Although obviously these are very important. But let's also collect information relating relating to our mindset, to how we think. And how we feel, and not just once, but multiple times throughout our clinical journey. Let's look at the mind-body problem more scientifically. When we can do this, the philosophical question between where the body ends and the mind begins enters into the realm of scientific discovery, rather than science fiction. Thank you.